So now we're here. Um, so uh, we're continuing on uh, with from where we left off last week. And let me just put the Bible study up on the screen. And I always have to... What I notice is that when I fill the screen so that you guys might possibly be able to see it here, is that when I go back to the recording later, that never happens. I don't know why the recording is always different from uh, what we actually do here, but it is. Anyway, uh, so uh, this section is called Your Body, God's Home. And uh, I start off with this statement about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which happens to be a biblical fact, and we're not going to take the time. I just, excuse me, (laughs) I just put in Bible references for anybody who felt so compelled on their own to look up and see that John 14, 16, and Romans 8, 9, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19 actually establishes the biblical fact of the Holy Spirit being inside us. But the question that I then put forward, is it just a work of God, or are you supposed to do something because God lives inside you? So, uh, where is that in your, in your notes? In your, in your materials? Uh, that's right above First Thessalonians 517. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't, I don't remember that. I usually put in a, a footnote. Uh, indicating that I pulled ideas out of the book that I'm using as a guide. Uh, I didn't do that. So, uh, I may have done that or I may have, I may have taken it from Comer's book or I might not have. I don't remember now. So, uh, anyway, um, I should go back and put this on gallery view. So, uh, so I guess the first question is, is, uh, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit just a work of God, or are you supposed to do something because God lives inside you? Do you have any thoughts? Have you ever had any thoughts about this? Do you have a gut-level knee-jerk reaction to the question? Absolutely no. Maybe. What's that? A simple thought. Not on my mind enough to say I don't know. Okay. But nobody has any thoughts. I mean, when you feel compelled to get something done, then you can't explain how you know that. And then other times it doesn't seem like they're going to be consistent. Like to, you know, it's like if 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 this guy's in control, then my will hopefully seems to be for you know I have to wrestle with the talent and stuff about things, and I often like that. Well, a lot of times I'm just a little passive. Well, um, so some people are just going to go do something. Okay. We should come back to the Calvinism comment in a moment. But first, I'm going to uh, acknowledge that Bonnie has her hand up. So therefore, she has something deep and intense to share with us, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I I mean I think it, this is the cop that answer, but it's both because God does it. 
it is God within us, but I think he also, it's something we're supposed to do too. So, you know, So, I mean, we have, I, I think it's both combined because he also gives us a choice. I think, you know, he gives us a choice. So yes, he, he, you know, the Holy Spirit, God talks to us and tells us stuff and tries to nudge us in that direction, but we still are the ones who have to go in that direction or we'd be just standing there, you know? Okay. It's like if you're standing on a corner and somebody says X, Y, Z is, you know, to your left, you can go to your left by choice, right, straight, or you can just stand there. I mean, so, but I do think that, or I not think, I believe that, you know, the Holy Spirit, God is, you know, dwelling in us, ha- gives us that beacon that, you know, it's like GPS. You can listen to GPS or you cannot listen to GPS. But what will it do? It'll keep rerouting you and rerouting you and telling you where the quickest way is to go. You don't have to listen to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and I didn't see that uh, GPS was going to be... Uh, um the main so, difference is that GPS is sometimes stupid. So that's like, true. Directions. <laughs> that was that was... <laughs> um, just, just a minute, Bonnie. Could you, uh, could you contact your mother? She's trying to get in, but, uh, and I'm not seeing any message saying she's trying to get in. So I, I don't know what's going on and, uh, I can't necessarily deal with this. Um, so going back to Ben's comment about, uh, Calvinism, uh, and I, I don't, to, to be honest, I haven't spent a lot of time studying the writings of John Calvin. He wrote way too much stuff. So therefore, you know, my motivation hasn't been super high. Uh, and then you have people who promote the concept of Calvinism where they've actually distilled down what they think it is into five points. And, uh, was that? Four. Yep. And uh, so they they get to this conclusion that you don't actually have any free will and that God is in charge of everything. It, is that kind of a conclusion, uh, remotely accurate, sane, or, or any other descriptive word that might go with it? That's their, their thing of irresistible grace, meaning that you know, when God chooses, you have no choice. You will accept him. And then also limited atonement. So that means not everybody has the opportunity to be saved. And so that is, I think those are two falsehoods. Right? Um, and if you've got two falsehoods, could you have more? Oh, so yeah, total depravity, unmerited favor, atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. So three out of five of two reasons. Okay, so you're a three point Calvinist. <laughs> I love it the way people say, "Well, I'm a five point." Well, no, I'm just a four point. And so now we have Ken, who's a three point, and uh, I've just been a smart aleck and said that I'm a no point Calvinist just because I don't buy into. Uh, this. So going back to what Ben is saying, it's like, is it possible that we sometimes overthink what we read in the scriptures to come up with, uh, conclusions and, uh, we're, we're reading more into it than is really there. Uh, yes, Bonnie, are you doing something? I, I couldn't find the button. Yes, <laughs> overthink the whole thing. Just say it. Okay. And, and and I think that's one of the reasons why we have so much division and denominational differences 
you know, separating one church from another, uh, I, I think that is, you know, from the point of, of overthinking. So if, so because we overthink, that might indicate that uh, uh, we're supposed to do something, but maybe we don't under- understand what we're supposed to do. Uh, and, and we're getting something a little bit wrong. If that's the case, what would that actually tell us? So, according to Ellen, it, Zoom says we haven't started the meeting. And yet, here we are. Unfortunately, I then kick that back to you, Bonnie, to, to deal with Ellen. <laughs> She's going into the wrong meeting. That's the problem. She's yeah. going to the older meeting. I'm trying to fix that. Okay. Got it. I never responded to your original question. You know, are you supposed to do something because God has decided it? Well, what we're supposed to do is turn our lives over to Christ continuously and have Him be in control of us. I mean, He He will got He will. There's nothing specific like. Uh, you know, we should, we should witness, we should love others, you know, those are things that we're supposed to do. But as far as a, as a, you know, should I, you know, move to the city? Should I do this? Should I do that? You know, those are things that, that, you know, if you're constantly, you know, turning your life over to Christ and confessing your sins and being faithful, then he will guide you. But I think there's, there's some leeway in what you do because, you know, there's no verse that says, you know, you should leave New Jersey and move to Maine. But we did that anyway because we felt God was leading us to do that, you know. Or you should eat pizza instead of a hamburger. Right, right. <laughs> Where that phrase, let go, let go and let God. You know, that's how simple it is. You don't have to overthink it. Just let go and let God. Just listen. And... But that, yeah. that was a moment for me where I really let go and found out what happened and really let God. I had, I was driving across the country and I just, I knew enough that I had to be where I was going. But I thought I was driving. Throughout the night without hard to think in. You know, I kind of just, my brain said that you can let your arm go. You can, you can stop pushing your foot. You can, I just, but my arm didn't move, you know, it stayed there. It just kept riding. But I stopped here and you know, it's over. So, you know, I already had faith before that, but that was a whole different, different kind of trust that I had to experience that one minute. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's me. I'm not telling you to. I know that if you know that it's not you knowing it, it will fill in the blind with you. Just whatever you have, and you know it's better than anything. Yeah. And there's, there's times where, you know, I've said or done something for no good reason that I could figure out. And then it's like, and they're like, how did you know that? I was like, huh. Why did you say that? Of course, this, this is happening, you know, and, uh, so that, that happened. It does happen every day, but it happens periodically. That's why it's Satan. That's why. Yeah. And so sometimes, uh, you know, you just, God uses you as a, as a vessel and pours out what he needs. Yeah. <laughs> Willing to accept it. Yes. Willing to accept it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I think going back to uh, what Dorothy said about the let go and let God, um, I don't, I don't necessarily think it's the literally, you know, Jesus take the literal wheel, you know, but, and, and I don't think, what's that? 
Although sometimes that happens. Oh, yeah. Man. yeah, there you go. Well, it's just that, you know, sometimes you, we don't realize that because we're humans and we want to be in control of everything. And, and, you know, sometimes that control that we have maybe in this place may not be we're frustrated with a friend or, or, or relative or, you know, whatever, but stop controlling. Stop trying to make it what you think it's supposed to be. And, and step back a little bit and like, oh, that God, that's kind of what I was getting. It's, we find things, we find two bollocks in Something in our own, own knowledge, you know, action and abilities, you know, we can, we can train them to do things, you know, that are pretty amazing, but, um, you still, you still don't know, you know, I'm a doctor and I tell people, you know, there's this much to know, and we know this much. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, you know, and I can't look inside people and tell what's wrong with them. I have to try and get it from the outside. It's like having a box and you know, and trying to try to shake it and find, figure out what's inside of it. You know, so mm -hmm. and uh, so it's you know, God, God's the only one that knows all that stuff, and um, you know, we. Uh, allow him to guide us and direct us, it's yeah. life a lot easier. Well, you know, there's another good example, too. Um, and that's the selling of Dad's house. You know, Annie has tried so many times to get a house and been disappointed so many times. And then all of a sudden, it's, it's like this house was waiting. Daddy wants them to be in that house. You're looking at those kids playing outside around that house and discover the toads and the cell layers and all those things that they haven't had an opportunity to do in the past. You know, it all just comes together. And you you can see all the times that she's tried and it hasn't worked out. Well, that's because this was going to happen. You know, and you you know that's that's a really that's kind of it's a really good lesson in, in being patient and what we provide to make things happen. You know, and that, that's a good point. You know, yeah. be patient. We're, we're an, an impatient people. Yeah. We want to get stuff yeah. yesterday, you know, especially in the U.S. So not oh. like that all, all over. Not all over, no. Especially us, it's like, don't just do something. Don't just stand there and do something, right? You know, yeah. That's the uh, goal and attitude. Yeah. And it takes a while to, like, don't just do something, stand there. That's Sometimes it's not like the Yeah, and, and, and so... Uh, that's what I was sensing from when you first said the let go, let God, is that we try so hard to always maintain control. And, you know, we can read about how God is all knowing and God is all loving, but that doesn't mean we're willing to actually trust him for that. You know, that, that that's a much harder thing for us to be able to do to, to live by, to live by faith. I know your hand went up and then your hand disappeared, Bonnie. Uh, have you just given up on what you thought you wanted to say or you just forgot you wanted to say anything? No, I think I hit the button. But <laughs> what I was going to say is to, to make it go away. I, I, I bring this book up often by Jen Wilkin. It's called None Like Him. And I was just Google. That's why I removed it because I was trying. Because it says in the it, uh, on the cover, ten ways God is um, different from us, and I think that a lot of times we try and in that control be God. And in this book, she picks ten I uh, areas that we try and control so much, and you know. Basically, we are trying to be God. And one of the examples that just always stuck in my mind, because I, it was one of the things that I was horrifically bad at was, um, you know, God is everywhere, right? He's everywhere all the time. And I used to be horrible trying to get from point A to point B. To not miss anything, to get everybody in the right places. And it was a comp, you know, you know, you, you got 
did not want to try and divide and conquer, had to be at every game, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, an example was when Nicole was doing volleyball, Ali was soccer, you know, two big things on the same day. I'm driving back between Monument and Highlands Ranch, trying not to miss a game through all this stuff. And at the end of the day, I left stuff in my car. My car actually got broken into stuff stolen. Another thing. But again, I was trying to control time. I was trying to control where every, you know, where I was, where everybody was and, and, and all these events going on. And I think I, that, that it just is a book that shows how much we try and control things that are just not controllable, but we do it every day in so many ways. And that was, you know, just one example she kind of used. And I saw it, how I would do it literally almost every day <laughs> and especially on Saturdays. Well, and, and I think part of our, uh, uh, the cleverness of our sinful nature is we try to find artful ways to make it look like we're not trying to control, uh, and we're trying to make it look like we are depending upon God, uh, when we're really just depending upon ourselves. Uh, so it, it, this idea of, you know, God works because he's inside us and we're supposed to do something. I think sometimes the biggest thing we're supposed to do is become honest about what we are trying to control, to become honest about the ways in which we don't trust him, to to wrestle those sort of sinful beasts to the ground in the sense that we, we own it, we're honest, and we give it to him. And then every time we try to take it back, we go, no, wait a minute. I'm not taking it back. I'm going to trust him now because we go back and forth between those things all the time. And we don't even necessarily are aware of how much we do that. So, uh, so, so that's an important issue. Well, to move along from that first question and get into, uh, our very long winded scripture that we have on, uh, first Corinthians chapter five, verse 17, which says, and, uh, and I'll, I'll read it to you because it's really long. Never stop praying. Okay. It, it's so long. Who can hold on to that and remember what it says? You know, it's, uh, it, it's only one word longer than, uh, the shortest verse in the Bible, which is Jesus wept. <laughs> so we should be able to remember this. So I had put a question in here, which was, is it difficult? to pray continuously. And, and, that, and now I, I kick it open for you to be able to, uh, uh, to comment. Is, is it difficult to pray continuously? I don't think it's hard. <laughs> you don't think it's hard. And, and why would you say that, Byron? Because everything is doable. You pray for his health and his guidance. I mean, it's now, was it that easy when you first became a Christian? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and, and I think that's an important thing for us to address is the fact that, you know, you know, for as long as you've been in Christ, you, you've learned how to get there, but not everybody, uh, is there and not everybody knows how to get there. And, uh, so, uh, and I know, Cindy, that you've been waving your hand wanting to speak. So I now, I now give you a moment to talk. Yes, and just before I do that, hello, Ellen and Bonnie. I was late coming in to be able to say my hellos to you that that you both. <laughs> so, good morning. So, I had a chance to look this over this past week and, and write some comments, and I'll just read what I wrote. Um um, is it difficult to pray continuously? Um, prayer. I write, communicating with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Um, this 
is part of of our relationship that um, washes over us always, continuously in a prayer states um, states never being alone. So um, I also look at it like, you know, this is my heavenly father and my earthly father, if I could continuously be in communications with him, um, I would be. Um, I would love to be. Um, and being in continuous, it's, it's, he's my heavenly father and he loves me. He cares for me. He created me. And, um, it's a joy to be in a relationship with him and to communicate with him and just knowing that he's there always, no matter what it is in my life. He wants to, um, hold me when I'm, um, when I'm having a hard time. He wants to hold me when I have joy. He wants to do all of these things. So I should be talking with him. It's not a relationship is two sided and to continuously just brings you greater joy. Okay. Um, I would make comments on that, but first I see Bonnie's hand is up. So I have to restrain myself. (laughs) You want to say your comment first? No, because I'll get launched and, and I'll never get to you. So I'll, I'll go to you first. Sister, she will too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, I will say this is the sinful nature of not being able to always do that. And we were having this discussion in our life group and tr- praying and, and all of a sudden, Oh my goodness, is the laundry ready? Or, oh my goodness, did I forget to do this? And then mine just goes into a whole nother thing. And, and that is one of the things trying to sit and pray for a length of time sometimes can be very hard because our our brain will start thinking of all these other things. And I know I will do it. I, 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 I now catch myself more realizing that. Like I'll be praying about something and then all of a sudden my brain will think, like I said, oh, laundry. And it'll be like, stop, refocus. And I had um, two of Ali's friends stopped over the other day. And um, we were having this conversation. And one of the things that both girls said was, oh, yeah, no, if you're going to do that, you can only do things in like two max three minutes or your your mind will wander. You will start thinking something else. It's hard to keep your attention for longer than Two minutes is push. Two minutes is hard. Three minutes, you are totally pushing it. And I will say, sometimes I find myself not all the time now, but I do find myself, you know, tr- you know, sitting with the Bible or whatever, and all of a sudden, brain goes, but that could be me too. But I'm hearing it from other people, so okay. Um... So now Alan is anxious to weigh in on this. So go ahead, Alan. Yeah, I got it in. What is prayer? You know, I think we need to understand or define what is prayer. <clears throat> For different people, it might be differently. Is it prayer could be meditation, like what Bonnie says, you know. And you can pray even if I were walking, if I'm in distress. I just pray inwardly. You know, I don't need, sometimes I need to kneel down. Or sometimes when I eat, 
you know, it's more a formal way. But prayer does not need to be formal. It's just having that connection with God. That's prayer. It's like, you know, I think we define prayer sometimes you have to kneel down or sometimes, and even if I eat, if I'm in a restaurant alone, I used to do that when I was in New York. I just say my prayer. I don't have to fold my hands. I just sit there. You know, it's like I, I agree meditating, that. having that connection. I, I agree in many ways. That. Yeah. There are many, I'm sorry, there are many ways of praying. Jesus had to go um, before um, the crucifixion. He told his disciples he needed to be by himself. Sometimes you want to pray on your own. Sometimes you want to pray with friends. I think it's not just one way. It's the basic thing is that connection. You can think of others not being there with that person. Okay. Okay. So, you know, in today's Christianity, they always, you know, especially with kids, fold your hands and bow your head, close your eyes. And that's the only way um, that's not described in the Bible as for praying. <laughs> it's lift your hands up to heaven, look up to heaven, lay flat on your face. You know, bow down before him, you know, but um, holding your hands and closing your eyes is is not mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Um, but that seems to be the thing, you know, that that we do. And and so you're getting you're making prayer specific act and not a presence, like like she said, a presence, you know, being in the presence of God is prayer, not not holding your hands and closing your eyes, because you do that and you can still not be praying. <laughs> so yeah. It's a we've we've made it an action instead of a um, instead of a way of life. Well, that makes it more possible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Try to hold the wheel. The <laughs> maps. Yeah. Wait, and you're driving and close your eyes. Right. <laughs> Although Ben can do that. No, just kidding. <laughs> no, I know. I'm just. I'm just teasing right now. You have you have reverence, which is an honorable thing. But then on the other side, you have a jubilance, which if you don't, you have too much reverence, then you're not going to be over exploring what happened in the movie. So, you know, that's... I'll find myself praying the Lord. I, I don't know. Sometimes, Jesus, but I mean, you know, you just Lord. <laughs> I don't know how maybe you should pray into each individual or I think Lord covers it. I mean you look in the in the um in the Psalms um and in there in the first the Lord with capital L and many times in the Psalms that is referring to Jesus and the Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one. So I think using the Lord, I think that can cover all three. Right. Well, <laughs> yeah. So when Christ taught his disciples to pray, you know, but Christ prayed to God, to his Father. You know, so, you know, I, I think that that's who we should address our prayers to, through Christ. It's through him that we can have access to the Father. So, you know, but our prayers, you know, I believe should be to to God the Father, whether we say that or not, you know, and Christ is the way that we have access to. Um, I, I, I think, well, going back to what you said about little children and what we tell them, uh, at one point when we were had, you know, all of the kids showing up on Wednesday night, you know, Julie and I were making the point that, uh, the only reason why you would bow your head and close your eyes would be because you're in a room with other kids and what do they want to do? They want to look at each other, make faces and play. And, and so the whole point was to say, you know, sometimes you need to block out everything of the world so that you can focus on God. But we used to say that's not a requirement every time you pray 
we just ask for it so that at least for a few moments while we're praying here, you can focus your mind on God for a moment. But when you're home, in your body, whatever, you know, that's not a requirement that God makes. So we used to always uh, you know, make a point of explaining that to the kids. Whether they heard it, whether they remembered it, I have no idea. But we at least tried to make the distinction that that was not, you know, a requirement that God had for them. Uh, you teach them, you want the kids in a circle, and you say, okay, sit on your hands and eyes all over. You know, because their hands being busy, if they can, you know, make that not busy and put their eyes someplace, then they're not busy. It's, it, it must have come from that something, you know. It, it, and, it could be. <clears throat> right. And and the fact that you, you like that picture of a small child, which you think is so sweet, yeah. but that's only because that is the outward manifestation of what you hope is going on inside the person's heart. In other words, you don't have to do the outward manifestation to have a relationship that is reverent before God. My yeah. yeah. Ellen? <laughs> um, I, th- I think it is, as I th- uh, spoke earlier, there is a formal way of prayer and there is that informal way of prayer. I remember when I had my surgery um, of my knee, you know, they put me almost to sleep, and I was lying down there, but I was praying. Yeah. So, you know, and I knew that it is, It. I think my definition of prayer is just having that connection with God. I could say something like, God loves me and meditate on that word. God cares for me. Just meditate on the word. And that's prayer. So yeah. I think it is the distinction from a prayer when we're in church, right? We kneel down and some people can't kneel down. Right. Like elderly. So Prayer is connection with God, and he will understand. I think that is, you know, and he understands that expressing our need to God. Yes. Uh, What I want to ask now, uh, as we move forward with this conversation, is how do we need to think of God in order to be able to Pray continuously. Uh, uh, the Bible gives us, you know, a picture of of God. It gives us a picture of God in three persons, uh, and you know, and and we're supposed to think of, you know, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in a particular way. Uh, what is the way in which we're supposed to think of God? In order to, uh, in order to maybe pray in the way that, that Ellen is defining. Does anybody want to, uh, to tackle that question? Does anybody understand the question? And your body, your hand is up, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go first. Okay. I feel that it is that fear and not a negative fear. It is that fear of respect, that fear of awe. I think when you pray, that's part of what, when you are praying, is it is those two. I, I think that that fear is it is needs to be very present in that. And again, I. I hate that I have to keep prefacing that it's not negative fear. It is that fear of, of that omni presence, that power that he has. That's just so amazing. Okay. We haven't quite answered the question that I've asked, but go ahead, Ellen. You know, it's communication with God. Like, um, just 
a minute ago when I'm having Zoom problem here. The first thing I said, look, <laughs> I got up early, right? And here I can't get. And then I I wrote down the Zoom that you gave me. And so I got sort of agitated. But then I said, you know, just God, just guide me. If this is what you want me to do. And then God answered. Maybe it might not, but I knew I was just communicating with him, with God. You know, it's that kind when um, you say continuously, and I could walk. Sometimes I walk outside with this weather, you know, and then on that walk, I pray, just guide me to know where, you know, that you're with me, that I might not fall. Okay. So what exactly is God? If we're going to define God, how do we define what is God? God is love. Well, God is love. In First John. Well, that, right. And, and that's more of a definition of maybe traits, character qualities, and things like that. Uh, can we go a little bit even more basic to what is God? Do you have the answer, Bonnie, for what is God? Can you answer that question? Okay. He is our creator. Okay. He is our creator. Okay. That's that gets more into the function of what he has done and, 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 and what he does. Uh, but what is God? He is, is many of, things. Um, he is many things. You know, it's he is he he can be your father. Yes, according to the Bible, he created <laughs> us. You know, he could be your conscious. He can be. He is so many things. I think. Okay. And that is that relationship. It's not just one thing. So. The Holy Spirit. So I am Brad, and I happen to be a pastor, and I happen to be a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. And those are things that, and I started out and I was just somebody's child when I started life. But really, what am I? You're a being. You could be a being. Okay, I, I, I'm a being. You're a child of God. Remember that. I, I am a child of God. Yes. Ben, I know you were trying to speak. What, what were you saying, Ben? The sum of all wisdom and experience. The sum of all wisdom and experience. Um, He's a friend. Okay. He, he's a friend. And, and and think about friends that you have on earth. What what are those? I mean, how do you define? I mean, yes, you define them because they're your friend. But if you were to get away from defining their attachment to you, uh, how would you define them? A caring friend. A caring friend. The okay. way you described yourself. You need to reword the question, I think. Well, I, I'm trying to. I feel like the only way I can word the question is by giving the answer to the question Maybe. in the question, and that's that. That's a, a bit of my dilemma here, and and I'm having a hard time, you know, coming up with with well, that. We're a little bit. It's a loaded question. What they say. What What was that, Ben? We're a little bit. A loaded. Oh, sorry. Oh. Okay. I'm going to have to give you the answer because. Because you guys are a hundred percent lost. Because and 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 I've defined all of these things that I am to people, you know, in titles that I hold. But in the end, I'm just a person, right? You know, and you're just a person. So, 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 how do you define God? How does the Bible even define God? 
This is a theological question. Yeah. What's you that? Mean like, but but righteous. he is righteous. But those are descriptions of the person. But what the Bible defines is the Bible defines that you have God in three persons, right? That you know that the the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to see them as people. And because what would be the other way maybe to see him is like a force, you know, a power, you know, uh, do you, can you have conversations with a force or a power, you know? And then the next question is, if God is a person and, and we'll, I'll, I'll give Bonnie a chance to, to speak here. Uh, but I'm just going to put that question is out was, how do you have a conversation with a person? So, and, and that's just a question to hang in the air while I talk to Bonnie. So, Bonnie, what do you got? I mean, do you mean like, I mean, he's king. He, he's the highest. He's the almighty. He's the highest of the highest. But now you're getting into, uh, you're, you're getting into you're titles saying? and job descriptions here, you know, <laughs> because, because you're an accountant, you know, and, you know, we don't just go before you and say, um, Bonnie, uh, let's talk about numbers because you're an accountant. So that's my relationship with you. It's all numbers all the time, you know, but that's not the relationship, you know, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, yes, you are your daughter's daughter or your mother's daughter. That would be a better way of phrasing it, but you're not a child anymore. So she may have talked to you like a child when you were a child, but you're not a child. So she would have to speak to you as an adult. So, I mean, that's defining more of, of who and what you are. And Cindy was talking about the way she would have conversations with her father. And she was talking about having conversations with God that were sort of similar to conversations with her father. And if you think of God as a person, then what Cindy said makes a whole lot more sense. But if you think of God as being a force, a power, this, you know, all powerful, omnipotent, omnipotent thing, omniscient thing. It's like, how do you have a relationship with something that's that overwhelming? Whereas when, 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 when the Bible defines God as, you know, a person, it's like, okay, I can have a relationship with a person. You know, I can talk to a person. So that being the case, uh, so, if you're thinking about God being a person and talking to a person and you're going to, and and we're talking about praying continuously so now what does how do you relate an understanding of having a conversation with a person so when you have a conversation with a person um uh do you talk to them with nonstop flood of words is that the way it goes yes ellen you know like when you read a book, right? And that person, the character in that book becomes real to you, right? And that is when it's the same that when we read the Bible, God, Jesus becomes real. Like, um, I'm this um, Bible class, believe it or not. And they are doing the little prince. It's like allegory. And just reading this book, the little prince, he becomes real to me, to us all. But how do we, and that's how we relate to God. You know, when we read the Bible, when we read Matthew about what Jesus does, uh, this, this woman on the well, on, on, you know, we create pictures in our head and oh. it becomes like real. Yes, and, and the only distinction Imagination, that is the word. And that connects us with our we call that our spiritual you know, that spirituality. It's not litter, it's that there is that. We were created with this gift. Right, and and, and, gift. and as you use the, uh, uh, the 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 analogy of the book 
Uh, the only difference between the analogy and life in Christ is in the analogy, uh, you know, people who study and talk about this stuff from an academic point of view, they would say that when you're reading The Little Prince, or The Littlest Prince, I don't remember what the title is called, but but that particular book, I know the book you're talking about, they would say that it becomes real to you, just like characters in a book or characters in a movie, and they refer to that as the willing suspension of disbelief. You know, in other words, you you choose to stop telling yourself that it's just a story or it's just something you're reading in a book and you're willing to start taking it on as if it's real. The difference there is that God is real. We, we're not having to suspend our disbelief. We're going from disbelief to belief, and we're not pretending that we're believing, we're actually really believing. That that would be the difference. And, and I only say that because we use illustrations, and illustrations do have their flaws. They do have their shortcomings. And so I just wanted to define the illustration a little bit more accurately. So, since God is a person, how do you have a conversation with a person? What does that end up looking like? You talk continuously, a flood of words. You never shop long enough so you can let the other person talk. When you have a relationship with someone, it's a two-sided conversation. It should be. Okay. Um, So there is listening to each other. There is trying to understand each other, um, asking follow-up questions, being involved in the relationship between two people Mm -hmm. um it's not a one-sided yeah so i think um continuous in a relationship and the definition of a relationship it's a two-sided thing okay i'm going to go to you bonnie but i want to throw out there another question which is how do you handle that aspect of a conversation when you have the long periods of mutual silence between the two of you. But having said that, uh, I'll ha- let that hang in the air for you to think about as we hear what Bonnie has to say. Actually, that was part of what I was going to say as I was listening. Oh, good. Something, And it said one of the things that the Bible talks about is <laughs> quiet and silent and rest. And that is one of the things is just being in stillness. That's the word, being in stillness. And I think sometimes it's just not letting us constantly go, 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 reading, you know, it, even though reading scripture, doing Bible studies, all of that is good. It's just being quiet. That's it, it was. Being in stillness and being quiet. And I can't remember what verses it was. I was kind of trying, you know, I'm trying to Google as I'm talking here of what it was. But in the Bible, it talks often about us being quiet and still. And that is how we actually hear God's t- speaking to us. Okay. Um, and, and, and then there's the question that I put out there that you're addressing and, and then considering that the scripture that we're looking at says never stop praying. I want you to now, I'm going to put it out there before I let Cindy respond to you, uh, and just throw this question out there, which is how do you pray continuously when you have the long moments of quiet and stillness? in the middle of prayer. So I'm just throwing that out there for people to give some thought to, and we'll get back to it. But right now, Cindy, what did you want to say? Um, The silence, we need to be content with silence. Um, And when you have a relationship with somebody, and it's a mutual, loving relationship, you can have um, enjoyable silence between one another and it says in in psalms 23 the lord is my shepherd he shall not want 
He leads me beside still waters. And you think about that, you know, if you're sitting on the bank of a, of a still waters and, and the comfort, the joy in just that peacefulness of flowing water against, you know, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's in Psalms 23 that God lead up, leads us to those quiet, silent waters. And Cindy, I think my reference is in that that Psalms, how it relates to different parts. I think that's one of the verses I'm thinking of. Yes, yes. Out of Psalms that lead somewhere else. I mean, that stillness is a part of the prayer because you speak and you, and then you listen, and stillness is not a bad thing. Not saying anything, just being quiet. Mm. It's still prayer. I, I don't know, you know, I know as a, as a young chairman, and you walk into a room full of curls, <laughs> you, you don't, you can't talk for anything else. I can't, can't imagine going to Fort God and Jesus. I don't know, I don't know that they yeah, love me, you know, it's a, but they will just want to talk to them like you were a friend. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, as, as the writer of our book says, that, uh, it's, it's a, a tech, it's not a technique where we control our relationship with God. And he calls it a skill. In other words, this is something you get yourself to the point where you're able to do. You don't just walk into a relationship with God and understand, uh, how to do, how to do this. Um, Unfortunately, we're actually out of time. And I didn't, when, when I posed my last question, I wasn't looking at the little clock I have here and I didn't realize that we wouldn't be able to, to, to get to it. Um, but, uh, I don't think, you know, continuous prayer is necessarily about constantly talking. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's about constantly being conscious of being in the presence of God and, and including God in, in what you're living. And, uh, so that means that you can actually talk to him about what you need. And it's not an odd thing to say. I mean, you don't feel a need to suddenly clasp your hands, close your eyes, bow your head because you need him. It's like you're in the middle of doing it and you're like, okay. I, I'm really struggling with this. There's something I don't understand. You know, if anything, uh, I, I need your peace right now or whatever it is that you need. I think you're, you're just talking to God and, and trusting him for things, you know, just in the moment that you're in and he's just included in everything that you're doing. So, uh, <clears throat> um, one of the bullet points that I have in my notes is that when all of life is holy, uh, then God's presence is actually integrated into every moment. And if we think of all of life as being this holy gift of God, then he's a part of every moment that we're in. So I think when it says never stop praying, I don't think it means never stop keeping your eyes closed and your head bowed. <clears throat> it, it means that, you know, you're just conscious that God is with you because, well, he's inside you. So of course he's with you. <clears throat> and, and I think we need to just get to the point where we're, we think that way and it just becomes the natural part of how we are. So we have completely run out of time and it's going to be time to go.